Welcome, we're joined by Anna Ohanyan, Professor of Political Science and International Relations at Stonehill College. Anna recently also co-edited a book about the Armenian Velvet Revolution, which was released today. Anna, thank you very much for your time. Um, it's a pleasure, Emilia. Recently, you wrote an article for Al Jazeera entitled Belarusians Can Learn a Lot About Armenia's Velvet Revolution. You mentioned that the protest movement in Armenia didn't push for foreign policy shifts in order to not alienate Russia, presum presumably. Why is this so integral to success? And what do Belarusians need to do to ensure this? Um, sure, I think the, uh, the comparison between the two countries is, is an important one to make uh, because both of these countries uh, are, have attempted uh, democratic transition in Russia's uh, authoritarian orbit. And Armenian model, if we could uh, describe it that way, is an instructive and it's significant globally as well. If we're trying to understand what are the scenarios and possible pathways of all of, or all of the countries, post-Soviet countries in the post-communist space to democratize. In the immediate post-Soviet period, the color revolution described associated with strong uh, international involvement and geopolitical divisive rhetoric and largely top down has dominated, seemed to appear uh, the sort of the dominant scenario which the countries could follow. Uh, but the Armenian model demonstrates that democracy, number one, is not a Western export. It's actually grassroots and it's not necessarily European idea. So in this respect, Armenia's by tra Armenian uh, Velvet Revolution was significant because of its grassroots nature, the fact that it erupted within the civil society, largely outside of the political space. And indeed, um, the the leaders of the uh, revolution uh, signaled clearly, consistently and early that this is not an anti-Russia, pro-Western, that this is a uh, essentially directed, driven largely by domestic concerns. And I've watching as to what has been happening in Belarus, similar to Armenia, again, in uh, Russia's uh, security space. Um, it is also very grassroots. Uh, very much outside of the political party structures and the uh, and actually Belarus is even better positioned in some respects to a signal that this is not an anti-Russia uh, uh, or pro-European revolution and the movement leaders I think have been trying to do that signaling that this is not directed against Russia that this does not have a geopolitical coloring but not surprisingly Lukashenko continues and his rhetoric continues to try to slap the color label uh, on the revolution because once doing it, it immediately becomes a security threat. So it's, uh, it, it is linked to instability in insecurity that erupted in Ukraine as well as in the Middle East in the Arab Spring. So, Well, you uh, say that, but um, the protest leader and current prime minister in Armenia, Nikol Pashinyan, uh, made it clear that the revolution was uh, unrelated to foreign policy and um, was not supposed to challenge relations with Russia, but opposition leader in Belarus, Svetlana Tikhanouskaya, has fled to Lithuania and has received the quasi backing of the US and the EU. Do you think now there is a real danger that Lukashenko can portray these protests as a color revol revolution? Um, just the fact, you're absolutely right. I think uh, uh, it is, uh, if, if, uh, if she did stay in uh, in in the country, it would have strengthened uh, the movement in some respects. It would have allowed the people to put a uh, face with the movement. But at the same time, it is an advantage that she's not there because the movement demonstrates that it is able to function without the symbol. And she actually uh, was more of a symbol than an opposition leader, than a movement leader, because she was sort of she was thrown into the situation after her husband uh, was imprisoned. Uh, the fact, so there are advantages and disadvantages, but the fact that, um, uh, but the fact that she's uh, in Lithuania, she's in the Baltics, I don't think that discredits, that makes this, uh, uh, this, this allows any opening to uh, Lekashenko to describe the uh, color label. It, in contrast, it actually highlights 
uh, something really significant that surrounds the movement in Belarus, which is that there is a very deep regional uh, envir connect connectivity surrounding Belarus, and uh, Belarus is surrounded by democratic societies, and more importantly, very deep contacts and connections between people and the civil society. I'm completing um, a new research on this, understanding this regional connectivity historically, and this factor of connectivity, regional connectivity, at the level of a civil society is emerging and is an important factor, at least in my work, uh, in putting countries on the right path to history. Um, so I don't think the fact that she's in the Baltics discredits her. On the contrary, actually, the, uh, Litu the Lithuanians, people in the, uh, Latvia, I believe in Estonia too, are talking about the Baltic way. Not the governments, but people in this region came out in support of the revolution. This is in contrast to Armenia, where Armenia, except for its democratic dyad, which Georgia is surrounded by authoritarian states. So regional environment for the Armenian Velvet Revolution was very inhospitable. So that's something that Belarus has going for it. So no, I don't think it is an opening for Lukashenko if the leaders, uh, movement leaders manage this well. It's not an opening to, to describe this as a color revolution. Uh, do you think that in countries like Armenia and Belarus, there actually is a desire to break off from the Moscow orbit and move towards the West, uh, much in the same way that Ukraine and Georgia did? Is portraying these protest movements as unrelated to foreign policy just a tactic, really, to avoid Russian hostility? Um, I like, I very much agree with the second part of your question that it is really important and academically it's an important uh, uh, question, meaning that we should, in my scholarship, in my work, I have talked about this uh, ability to kind of shield the movement from foreign policy and geopolitical influences as a tactic. Uh, but it is time to kind of think uh, long and hard as to what this means in the long term as a strategy for developing the state. Um, so, but in terms of uh, uh, the, the first part of, I, I lost my train of thought, thought Emilia. What the about first part was, if there really is a desire, if people in Belarus... Oh, that's right, that's act, right. Yeah. That's right, that's right. So I think in terms of the public sentiments, both in our, I don't think it should be a choice. I think what is at stake for both people in Armenia and Belarus is their ability to have a choice, to have a voice in participating uh, in public discourse, political processes, in shaping uh, the contours of uh, uh, policy making, including foreign policy, uh, in economic decision making, trade policies. Uh, in both countries, they re in general, uh, and it continues to be the case, there is a very a lot of goodwill in relation to Russia. Uh, which uh, w even as the generational change from the Soviet collapse is happening. So this is a very important soft power resource for Russia. And I believe Russia was wise to recognize this and not interfere militarily, in which case they would have uh, really squandered and attacked this resource and mobilized people against them. Moreover, economically, the structure, and I'm not an economist, I should clarify this, but I do look at political economy issues. The structure, there's some people uh, at various segments of the society who are better linked or benefit or benefit or are stakeholders from integration with European market and others uh, with the Russian market in both cases. Both countries have a pretty significant IT sector, uh, but Armenia in particular also has, is dependent on remittances, on the migrants. So I, I don't think even economically it makes sense for uh, the the leaders to kind of make a choice. Obviously, both countries are within Russia-led uh, groupings, uh, but still, I think the people should have, and that's what people want, a voice to determine as to which way their countries should go. And often it's going to require small states do need to be engaged in multiple groupings. The number of regional organizations is growing. Many countries are part of several groupings. So this complementarity and flexibility uh, is politically significant for both countries.
So far, Alexander Lukashenko seems to be holding steady. He has retained the support of the security forces and the Kremlin for the most part. Um, what did Armenians do that Belarusians have yet to do? And do you see a scenario where Moscow is just going to outright abandon Lukashenko? Um, in terms of, I think, the key difference between the two is the strength and the depth of Armenia's civil society. Armenia had longer periods, a lot more scars, if I could put it this way, in uh, mobilization. There were Armenia actually, in academic scholarship, was always classified as a stable, competitive authoritarian system, but interestingly, also a country with the highest levels of mass mobilization against their governments. So this dilemma, uh, no, I'm sorry, not a dilemma, this, uh, uh, um, the puzzle essentially has been fascinating. In the, so because Armenia had multiple cases, large and small uh, issue specific movements, and it, uh, there was a learning curve. Armenians already knew by the time the Velvet Revolution erupted that if you congregate in a public square, security forces will be more successful in dispersing you. So they developed as a result an organizational flexibility moving from square to square. In the case of Belarus, the civil society since Lukashenko came to power in 1994 has been crushed and obliterated. So uh, that is a huge disadvantage for Belar for the people, for the protesters, because uh, they're weak organizationally. As to, and Russia obviously has been supporting Belarus and Lukashenko in particular, primarily with economic resources, the subsidies, Belarus has been able to get the uh, Russian oil and refine it and sell it at world prices uh, in Europe. All of those subsidized, uh, Belarusian economy, which actually never privatized, post-Soviet period never liberalized. So 80% of the Belarusian economy is in the heads of hands of the public sector. So this gives uh, Putin an important card in managing, controlling Lukashenko. And I don't know whether it will, he will abandon him or not. It is, I think, uh, his bargaining power is enormous and he definitely can push the union between Belarus and Russia, which Lukashenko has not been signing. Um, but whether choices for Putin are abandoning um, uh, Lukashenko and supporting other pro-Russia uh, parties, I don't know what he will, uh, he will decide. He might ultimately decide to support Lukashenko just because Lukashenko's bargaining power is so little. And um, briefly, if you could, in terms of comparing Serge Sarkisian and Lukashenko's regimes, uh, many are saying that the economic record that the Lukashenko regime has is better in terms of employment, in terms of emigration. Do you think this will play a part in the outcome of the protests? Uh, that, that, that's actually a huge debate in political science, whether uh, democracies are driven by uh, uh, economic uh, interests or values. That is correct that uh, Belarus is economically in a better position because it was uh, perhaps one of the most russified, militarized, uh, but also more fully integrated into the Soviet administrative economy. It was it has a very strong industrial base, a lot of factories, etc. Uh, while and it never really again privatized. That's this is the key issue. Never liberalized. In the case of Armenia, even before Sir Sarkisian. Uh, economy, uh, economy uh, liberalized, which actually created the problem of oligarchy and the instability, which so many countries grappled with it. It wasn't just in Armenia. Uh, and it did create, produced Armenia's very specific authoritarian system, soft authoritarian system controlled by the Republican Party, which actually used, created pretty strong party structures that were integrated into the state apparatus. In the case of Belarus, because this privatization never happened, that allowed Lukashenko to maintain stability, but it is not a winning model. The, this, this model that essentially in some respects, even Russia uh, privatized, and, uh, but has been subsidizing Belarusian economy. In this case, Lukashenko is being more Catholic than the Pope. Um, so uh, 
to the the risks of this model of this economic model uh, in Lukashenko is that because the share of the economy is in the hand of the state, uh, that this concentrates political power as well. And it plays a role while Armenia had to deal with this oligarchy, but it also the privatization, uh, the reduction of the political space of the state in some respects also created more room for civil society. Uh, but the fact that Armenia also had the uh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict to deal with, Armenia also had a lot stronger independence movements um, uh, in, in the country, and all of these contributed for the development of civil society. These were really absent and frozen. Development in a civil society have been largely frozen. Um, and in, uh, in Belarus, whether Lukashenko stays in power or not, I think things are not going to be the same. Uh, there's a new generation that has not lived in Soviet Union. So all the discourses, all the uh, cards that has Lukashenko has used are not going to work anymore. The fear factor is broken. So while he can control the public through the state, fa uh, state in, uh, various factories and uh, the, the, again coerce uh, uh, people, prevent them joining the movements. I think that the things are moving in a different direction. And the fact that there are many women out in the streets is a huge factor as well. It's a very good marker that this can head in the right direction. Uh, Ms. Ohanian, thank you for your time. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for your interest, Emilio. And thank you for joining us on CivilNet.